No, nah, we don't need that. <laughs> All right, so the idea is that the occult suggests we have a certain power to manipulate the forces of nature and the forces of causality. And this should, I think, for us raise certain questions, uh, certain philosophical questions, which uh, come from an idea which is not really common to most people. The idea that you can manipulate causality is kind of unique to ceremonial magic and that kind of thing. If we take this seriously as an effective tool, we can gather information and we can learn new things and, and stuff like that, but I don't think there are any ultimate answers to these questions. And I want to specify that specifically because there's been a lot of occultists over the years who kind of their first move is to formulate this huge system that explains everything. And that's just, I don't think that's possible. I really don't think it's possible. Like, you look at uh, Frederick Codd, who was one of Crowley's main students, who he considered to be, at first period of time, the magical son that was prophesied in the Book of the Law. He came up with this whole reversal of uh, the Tree of Life, where everything was just opposite and going the other way, and he thought this was, like, this huge contribution to the system. But it's, it, it, it's, it's fucking, as far as I'm concerned, wanking. Like, it's completely pointless. There's no reason to mess with stuff like that. He was just trying to invent a new system and come up with an ultimate answer. And uh, I think the questions that come up here don't have ultimate answers. They're things that we think about, and our ideas about them will grow and evolve as our practice in the occult grows and evolves. But um, it, it's not like you finally figure it out. It's like, yes, I got it. Um, so the first, the first question I want to talk about is the question of authority. So it's like, okay, we're talking about the ability to manifest spirits, to influence causality, to change the way that things work around us in the world. So what gives us the right to do that? Um, in the golden, in classical ceremonial magic, it's constant references to Jesus Christ and the concept that you have been saved by Jesus and therefore you have the right to boss the spirits around. Uh, in modern ceremonial magic, which is derived, all, almost all modern ceremonial magic is derived from the golden dawn with the, the, the pentagram rituals and the hexagram rituals. And uh, that is connected in the same way. So, like, uh, if you accept the idea these symbols give you the right to boss the spirit around, what does that mean? One thing that I like to point out, which I don't know if we have Wiccans here, uh, they, uh, the pentagram is essentially connected to Jesus. Uh, the, the classical name for Yahweh, or uh, the God of the Old Testament, is the Tetragrammaton in old ceremonial texts. Uh, which means the four-letter name. And Jesus has the five-letter name, the pentagrammaton, which is the same four letters, but with a, a shin inserted in the middle. So there is an essential connection there in a, a way that you're kind of like relying on the same symbols and the same symbol system. So I'm not trying to answer this, but I would say, what does that imply? What does that mean? I don't know what it means firmly, de definitively in any way that I would say that I'm like completely convinced of the answer, but I think that it's an interesting question. I think it's something that people should think about. Now, none of this is going to be answers. This is just questions. <laughs> this is just things that I think people should think about. Um, this is a good corollary to uh, chaos magic, because chaos magic, we, uh, we design our own symbols and our own little sigils or whatever. We do what we do with them. We charge them. We sacrifice them. We do something with them to get our results or whatever. And chaos magic is very effective. We get results doing that. At the same time, you have people who are completely unaware of the true meaning of the pentagram or the name of Jesus who use them effectively in ceremonial magic. So, again, what does that mean? Like, I am, I'm, I'm not totally clear, but at the same time, it seems like there's one that's a symbol that we imbue with meaning, and that's effective, and there's another symbol that's effective whether we know what the meaning is behind it or not. And that, I think, is significant. Um, there are uh, philosophers who talk about this question of authority in very different ways. And I don't want this to turn into a dissertation on different philosophers because I don't feel like we have the time to give any of them the proper treatment. But I will recommend, as I go through each point that I have here, I will recommend different people to read that address these issues. Uh, one of them, in, the, in terms of the question of authority, uh, we have Nietzsche, who is very significant, who Alistair Crowley describes as a prophet of Thelema, who has a very strict idea of the question of authority, and it's a very uh, firm sense of, 
you know, who can exert power, who has the will to power, they have the right to power if they have the will to power. Um, Spinoza is another one that I would I would bring up in this reference and uh, in his geomet uh, what is it called? In his book on ethics, he uh, he describes the idea of the substance uh, when he puts it in sub hyphen stance, as in what our being is predicated upon, and that's sort of his definition of God. And I still think he is the best uh, argument for the existence of God that I've ever read anywhere. Uh, at the same time, um, this idea of the substance kind of gives you an idea of where your authority comes from. Um, in in, uh, in the Genesis in the Bible, it says that we are created in the image of God. The pentagram is supposed to be in the image of a human being. And Jesus Christ, and we look at the Bible as an allegory, not as true, not as history, not as history, it's a story, just like Zeus, just like, you know, Odin or whatever. And the idea is God became a person. So we try to make ourselves analog analogous to that person in the role of God, and that becomes a source of authority. So I think that's significant as well, which is also why I'm going to recommend Thomas Aquinas, who I think is not a good philosopher and not logically consistent, but he is essentially the basis of Catholicism, and I think that's why people should read him, whether they disagree with him or not, just to see what he's saying and see what his argument is and understand, because Catholicism has had a huge influence on human history, conquered many countries and had an influence on many cultures, reinvented several cultures, and it's still like, Christmas is coming up, like, hello, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that is an invention of Catholicism. Uh, whether it's derived from pagans or not, that's why everyone celebrates it. So yeah, I think that Aquinas is someone that's important to read. This brings us to the question of ethics. And that's one that I addressed a little bit in a, a previous a previous talk, but um, I think that it's important to revisit slightly. Uh, this asks us questions like, why do we use magic, and how do we use magic? Uh, when, uh, once we get the point past the point of, oh shit, this really works. Hey, there's really a spirit there. Like, awesome. Because that's the first thing. But after that, it's like, where do you go from there? Like, what are you doing? Is it part of a graduated plan? Is it part of uh, something that's actually like has an end point and is going somewhere, or is it impulsive? And a lot of people do magic very impulsively. 